All right, folks, we are live and we are back. Let me change the microphone. That should be way better. Uh, we are finishing up the second part of the interview that we watched yesterday on this channel. We did a deep dive on Sham Sankar and on the 20 VC podcast. So we're going to finish that up. We've got about 30 minutes left. Excited to finish it up. It was a really fun conversation. And we'll be analyzing all that Sham Sankar had to say and uh, keep going from there. <laughs> we are part of a cult. Yes, everyone here is part of a cult. Mr. Seymour Duck, Jeremy Brent, Eor was right, Luke Francis. I know you guys by name at this point. Like I legitimately, um, I, I just I know everybody by name. This is <laughs> I, I'm very sweaty because uh, I just got back from a run, uh, burned off a nice quick 500 calories, and hopefully we'll get the other 500 later today. But we are here to now analyze what Sean I have to say. I hope no one finished the movie. You know when you're with your girl and you guys are watching a show together and then you watch the show before she finishes watching the show and she gets pissed off at you? That's uh, that's how I would feel if you guys actually finished the podcast. So if you did, I mean, that's just not a nice thing to do. If you didn't, then you were loyal. Mario, you're always, admit you're always on my feed. Mario, thank you for being here. All right, here we go. Sham Sankar, 20 VC podcast. Let's keep analyzing what he had to say. Can I ask you, have you seen conversations change since uh sadly israel but russia but like, has the discussion changed with buyers in terms of their tone their requirement like, just has the world changed significantly then or has it continued in the same way the buyers here are very serious people who wake up every day thinking i might have to fight tonight you know or I i'm in the position of providing capability to people who might have to fight tonight so I don't feel a shift in tone. What I do feel is a shift in um, the rate of learning. What is there to learn from? You look at the tactics, you look at what is working on the battlefield. And many of these things are surprising. They're different. They're innovating very quickly. They're changing the concepts of what you think you would even need to buy to have survivable capability, to win the next, the next conflict. Uh, and that is evolving incredibly rapidly. And I think it continues to speak to this concept of, um, lower cost, attributable capabilities. You know, Instead of buying something that you think like an aircraft carrier or some space-based capability that's gonna be around for 30 or 50 years, and because it's gonna be around that long, it's gonna be so expensive, it's gotta just be perfect. It's like, I'm buying something I might use for the next year. Uh, you know, you look at Ukraine, many of these drones are single-use drones. So there is no sustainment. You know, like, what, what, what are we talking about here? There's like your whole supply chain changes, like you, the whole theory of how you're gonna employ the weapon is very, very different. And as a consequence, the logistics you need around it become very different. And that can liberate you to have entirely new concepts, entirely new business models that enable you to deliver the innovation, recognizing that what you're going to fight with in two years is not what you're going to fight with in a year, and it's not what you'd use today. Can I ask a really strange one, but a direct one? If you were to be in charge of the DOD today, what would you do from the procurement process, from the budgets, from deployment? What would you do if you're in charge? If I had one magic wand, one wish, it would be to return to a structure that we actually used to use, which is to have multiple competing programs to go after the same capability. So when we were building submarine launch ballistic missiles, we didn't have one program to build it. I think we had four. And this allowed, there's, there's a human factors element to this. And there's a, a practical technology element to this. Well, we weren't sure if they should be solid fueled liquid fueled. We, there was all sorts of technical questions. And so you can either have the loudest voice win, or you could do a forever never ending research project, or you can compete the ideas. And that means, you know, you're going much faster, you're learning, you're iterating. It's, it's an empirical discussion rather than a theoretical one. Um, you're buying down technology risk. Uh, but I think what's even more compelling than that is the human factor. I often think about what would motivate so many of these programs, like what would motivate the program manager to, to want to go faster, to want to insert new technologies more quickly? And the answer is nothing, because the distant threat of an enemy for a conflict that you might want to fight one day does not warrant blowing up your schedule, introducing risk, um, you know, maybe having someone yell at you, because you're just judged by cost schedule performance. And that's all you're going to think about. But I don't think that's healthy. And I think, you know, what, what, here, so my counterfactual would be what if there are two PMs who woke up every day? It's human competition. You know, it's like, I, you know, the, 
the government is going to buy some percentage of my product, some percentage of their product. And I am going to wake up every day to, to make, to win this. That's like a uniquely American thing. I, I think we're very good at that. And I think it is going to drive a lot of innovation. You, it solves a lot of the problems. Like, how do we get things to be cheaper? Well, I want the government to buy more of my products. So I'm going to build it cheaper. How do I insert new technologies? How do I go faster? Like, these problems are actually kind of a lack of internal competition. You know, we, we, the government focuses on competition in the industrial base. I think there's not enough competition inside of government. Is winning this att att attributable? Like if you think about single-use drones as an example, does someone in DC have attribution on their procurement process, working out it being a good buy, it being effective, when it's deployed four months later in wherever it is, miles, thousands of miles away? Is there attribution? Yeah, there's definitely going to be ex post attribution. But how do we how do we get closer to something ex ante? How are you making that decision? So today there is a pretty big disconnect between the people who are responsible for fighting, really the combatant commanders. Uh, and the people who are responsible for providing the equipment. Uh, and, and, and really, these guys, the fighters, they don't really have a vote. You know, they, they don't have, a, and I think that's one of the things we need to change. Where That's a good point. The people on the battlefield are not, you know, having a say over the technology they use, the software they use, or the weapons they use, but it's kind of forced down their throat via the providers, which are the defense contractors. And I think Shams, the reason he's saying this is because if they used Palantir stuff, they would not want to use anything else, but you have to actually care about the people using the software in order to value their input enough to procure the right software. Winning, winning the competition should really be about, okay, well, how much does the Indo-Paycom commander or the CENTCOM commander want of this variant versus that competing variant? And it doesn't have to be winner take all. It can be something like, I want 20% of these and 80% of those, and next year, you know, come back to me with better ideas. Let me let me taste the steaks and see which one I like. And, you know, I, I might allocate resources differently next time. And I think getting that faster feedback iteration cycle would be super valuable. It also lets us be a little bit more critical of quote unquote requirements. And the requirements are the things that must, you know, we've done this analysis and we said these things must exist and we're going to build all of them. Well, clearly requirements change. The only thing you know for sure is the requirements are wrong. And so how do we enable our program managers to take more risk and say, well, you know, I think these requirements are more important than those requirements. And I think there are requirements they haven't even thought of that really matter. Because at the end of the day, you got to taste the steak. you got to taste, you know, you got to eel the product, use the product. And that's the only way you're going to know if it's good or not. And it, it, it's that, you know, can you imagine if the Valley didn't have something like that with its buyers, that the way that every new product was going to be evaluated was through a historical list of requirements that someone else came up with and a paper PowerPoint exercise to see which product someone was going to buy. No, we, we innovate because we fight with our technology in the customer's office. Can I ask you, how do leadership changes impact buying processes? I know that's a weird one, but as you look towards elections, both in the UK, the US, like, do discussions just kind of break down because everyone's wondering which government will be in power? How does it change processes? I think much less than people think. There's obviously some effect, uh, and I think it, it varies by country in, 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 the, in, the, in the UK system, given how involved the cabinet is with approving contracts and the oversight and integration with Treasury. It's actually more relevant in terms of what agenda people will be following. Uh, in the U.S., I think the bigger issue is really Congress and whether there's a budget or not. You know, we, we don't have a budget. We'll enter a continuing resolution. In a continuing resolution, that means you can't have any new starts. So all the things the department wants to do, they're gated and waiting until there is a new budget. And, you know, this is a, this is a consequence of our, our system. I think it's a little facile to say, like, Congress should just pass the budget on time. And yeah, like that would be that would be a nice world. But this is how we exercise political power and arrive at consensus. And I think there are um, there are things real quick. Trump just won New Hampshire. <clears throat> he beat Nikki Haley. They called it pretty quickly. So, yeah, Trump wins the second. It seems like she's going to drop out after South Carolina. And then, yeah. All right. Well, Trump wins. Things that we can do to make this better. But I think that's kind of the bigger issue in the U.S. Is there anything that Silicon Valley and VCs could do to better serve the defense market? We've this is going to be a fun question. I can already tell this is going to be good. This is the whole premise of Alex Karp's next book as well. It's spoken a lot about the role of government and selling to government. On the flip side, for like you know, the VCs like me of the world, what could we do better to serve defense tech more efficiently? If you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would, I would have had a long list of things that I think um, 
the capital class could be doing better to help in the national interest. I don't have those critiques. The capital class has showed up. The capital has showed up. The entrepreneurs have showed up. People are working on these problems. And it, it's just, I mean, it, it, make, it gets me so excited. Now, I think it, to the extent I had an ask from the VCs, it would be to engage with the policymakers so they understand the dynamics of your business. What is it going to take so that the $100 billion or more continues to show up? What does it take for these entrepreneurs to stay in this ecosystem? Why is a labor-based business model so bad? You know, like, because I, I think we can underestimate the size of the gulf between these two worlds. And you could even say it as something as simple as, you know, in DC, there's a, this, like, no conflict of interest. Like, if you have, you know, this idea of, like, we're going to manage all the conflicts of interest, and if you have any conflict of interest, it's very bad. And obviously, conflict of interest can be bad. On the other hand, in, in the Valley, it's like, well, if you haven't invested in something, how committed, like, how do you even have an opinion about it? Like you, you're not even willing to put your own money behind an idea. So what do you know about it? You, 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 you know, it's like, it's almost like no conflict, no interest. Uh, and there's, there's a middle ground between these things. But I think that's the first place to kind of get the relationship groove so people understand it. So it really comes down to high trust human interaction. We're not going to scale this through process. It's, it's going to come down to these two worlds coming together. And they've never been closer, but we still have a lot of work to do there. I do want to move a little bit of a layer deeper just into the company level with Palantir. You, you said something that I thought was fascinating. You said content, not process, is the eternal substance. I was like, right, good. That's helpful. Thank you. That's helpful, Sean. Uh, what did you mean content, not process, is the eternal substance? It, you know, Steve Jobs has this great lost interview about how companies get confused, uh, that when they're trying to replicate their success, they look at the process they went through uh, to deliver their first success. And uh, then they follow the process and it doesn't work because actually, you know, the first and most important thing is the content. It's the creativity, it's the substance. And that substance rarely, and as he points out, people who are good at content tend to be a pain in the ass to manage. You know, they're a pain in the butt, I think was his, his quote. Um, but you put up with them because the content is just so good. And so I think there's this way in which process as a medicine is okay. You know, it's like, can you have zero process? No. But if you hold process up as the deity, if process ends up being what is actually an opioid, it's very bad. It's like, look, we just need to follow the process and we'll get to the outcome. That's almost never correct. It, the process is going to, you know, when the process becomes more important than the content, you're going to lose. And a lot of this comes up as like, well, I wish the interaction could be less frictionful. I wish there was more predictability. I wish there was all sorts of things which are just not true in the real world. Like, yes, we all wish the world could be different, but when you honor what the world is, you kind of recognize how important it is to have the right rock band, right? There's no, hey, follow this process and we're gonna get there. Does that scale though? Because the challenge is you need process with scaling teams with increasing team sizes and the magicians who come up with great content, it's really hard to have structure around that. You need some way of having both, but you can't ever lose the primacy of content. To put it, put it this way, you can get really far with incredible content and bad process. You're going to get nowhere with, process, with incredible process and bad content. And so the primacy of it, you need to keep in mind. And this is what I mean by process as medicine versus opioid. Um, and, and so there's a role for this here. But at, and I feel like, you know, Palantir is this company that keeps reinventing itself, which is, is a whole other discussion we can kind of get to. But in those moments of reinvention, there's just content. There's just the crazy content and your commitment to it and making it better. Uh, and then you figure out how to get it to scale. And sometimes maybe getting things to scale is itself not scalable, it, which I don't mean as a critique. It's more like first you got to figure out the substance and then you work really hard every day it, to get it to scale. There's an old Silicon Valley saying, there's the first 80% and the second 80%. Uh, and, and so maybe there's a little bit of this in this where it's like, yeah, the first part of the content is 80% of the work and then getting it to scale through process is 80% of the work. Can I ask you, it's so hard to hire because you need to be able to detect those magicians, but then you also need to hire for process around them as well. And there is room for structure in both, as you said. When you reflect on hiring, you said talent spotting eats strategy for breakfast. How do you think about talent spotting and how has how you approach it changed over time? Yeah, I this is also really interesting because Sean, people don't know, Sean was the first forward deployed engineer for Palantir. So he hired and trained a lot of the original engineers. And so when you talk about having a knack for seeing talent, I mean, Sean 
was their first recruiter. So I'm curious to see how he talks about this point. I think this is so important. I think there's a way in which we've kind of constrained our cultures and our companies because we've leaned into the opioid of, of, of structure, essentially. Like, look, I'm going to structure my company as a factory. You're going to here are all the roles and the levels I have, and here's the org chart, and it's all very clean and laid out. And if you play by these rules, you can figure out how to navigate. I think one of the challenges is that like really talented people are highly asymmetric. You're much better off designing a role around who they are rather than saying, what role can I slot you into? It's almost like definitionally, none of those roles are going to fit them. It's going to put them in a position of relative weakness. They're going to blow something up. They're going to feel like they have to be good at something they're never going to be good at. And so it's, it's a total evisceration of, of their potential. And if you said and said, look, instead of being a factory, we're going to be an artist column. I don't get Dali to paint better by yelling at him to paint more like Monet. It's like each one of these individuals is an individual. And I'm going to go on a journey to craft a role around who they are, and I'm going to make it okay for them to, to, to like flex their role to, to meet their capabilities. Uh, and even more importantly, artists' work don't monotonically get better. This idea that you're going to climb levels in this sort of strictly increasing way, I think, is deeply in inauthentic. Some of your works are going to be hits, and then you're going to go through a lull, and you know your work might not be great. The, the the community might not appreciate it, and then your next piece is going to be a masterpiece. And so, how do you get into a place where you can be committed to your talent over a long duration? You know there's going to be ups. Dude, Sham is speaking truths right now. I mean, there are certain projects you're going to go for that are not going to work. Uh, I have experience in that. And then there's stuff that's going to work, but the commitment to continuously reinvent yourself, which is basically what Pound Tree had to do in the beginning, you know, first decade is they tried so much shit that didn't work and then eventually it did. You have to have people that are willing to reinvent themselves and stay along for the journey if, you know, you're ever going to find any level of real meaningful success. Ups and downs. But they're so fundamentally talented that you're going to stick with them and you're not going to be judging them work to work. It's not like a daily mark to market. It's like, look, this is you are special. This is a home for you. And we value you over this long arc of what we're building together. And that that means that when they're not performing, you don't suddenly have this responsibility to sideline them and put them in a hole or fire them. And I think in a factory, you kind of do. But, that, but let's just break that one down. So with those special people. When you think about the commonalities in what makes those magicians magic, when you look back at the ones you've hired and talent spotted, are there commonalities in them? I wish I could say, you know, I, I spent a lot of time trying to like systematize, yeah. like, okay, well, how can we systematize what makes these magicians magicians? And I think there's an element of, um, you know, really great talent spotters just know. I don't think I'm the best at talent spotting. I think I'm okay at it. But when I think about Dr. Carp, when I think about Joe, the number of the first 50 people that Joe personally recruited and town spotted when they had no practice, they're like 22, 23, there's no track record. It's not like you're looking at a prior body of work and saying, look at what you've done. It's just like, I, I still kind of look back at how Joe picked those people. And it's like, how, like, it's incredible. And I, I think there's a real skill to that. And if you have that ability, you know, you're almost like a talent agent. In the Hollywood sense, pulling it, you're, you're, you're the modern obits of, of Silicon Valley. Okay. This is why recruiters are important. I mean, he's making a good point here. It's not easy to spot and find really good talent. Um, I mean, it's difficult to, to find people that actually are good. So Joe Lonsdale, finding those initial people that got the company off the ground, that is a very important skill. Okay. So if you were kind of God given with this talent structure or talent spotting ability, great. But in terms of creating the environment where they are able to fail, create masterpieces as well, how do you think about doing that as, as I hate the saying here, but as their manager or as the person responsible for their work? Yeah, I think, well, we could keep leaning into the Hollywood metaphor here of, of the talent agent and the talent, you know, and um, how do you manage talent is a very open-ended question. But I think that's roughly how you would think about it, which is like, look, I'm really here to support. I need to create the environment that allows your art to flourish. I'm not the one managing your art. Uh, and so if you think about that, okay, they need a huge amount of autonomy. They need the resources. They need some protections from the daily distractions of certain aspects of the business. I think if, if you're always inhaling the full visceral, scary reality of everything going on, I think that distracts you from doing the art. So how do you have complete autonomy over an area that you're very, very good at uh, and the ability then to, to execute against it? 
And then I think a, a kind of maxim I always think about is smart people cannot be taught anything. They can learn, and that's the environment you're trying to set up. It's like, how do I create this environment of maximum learning for, for, for these incredibly talented artists? Can I ask, what happens if you continuously do duds? What if the masterpieces don't show? Yeah, I mean, I look, I think the artists might even blow up at that point. The, our, our artists want their art to be really good, too. So, you know, if, if, if they're really going through a, a rough patch for a long time, that might be part of your, I think that's going to be a judgment call as the talent manager. No, no, I really believe. Like, I understand this is a long dry spell here, but I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep you motivated. I'm going to keep you managing. I'm going to figure it out. Um, but of course, you know, you could just be wrong. Maybe, maybe the, the moment has passed. The art and the inspiration and the muse doesn't exist. Do you, do you think it's, is it potentially a bit of an ideological perspective to take? Because suddenly I tell you that your budgets have been cut. We're doing a 15% layoff. Sorry, artists, you haven't hit it out of the park for quite some time. Charm. Yeah, I'm, I think there, there are sometimes there's just external realities. Like you may have, you may have to do that because that's reality. Uh, and I think, you know, there is something, this is one of those things you have to think about how you shield or when you choose to shield the artist from, like budgets. Budgets are anti-creative. I'm, constraints are important, don't get me wrong. But I, I think like budgets are just anti-creative. So you have to think about when, what's the right mix of like, hey, at this moment, we really need budgets. It matters for these reasons. And here's why. And, and so, I, and I think you tend to find that like you kind of oscillate between two ends of, of a continuum, right? Like there's no budgets. It's free for all. It's max creative. It's like, oh, this is completely ungoverned and we need, you know, this thing. And you're, you're just trying to maintain the stable, unstable equilibrium rather between these points. VCs love to say something. Constraints enforces creativity. Do you agree with that, with the idea that budgets are anti-creative? Because budgets... This is actually a good question, dude. Yes, budgets are anti-creative, but you need constraints. Like, you need time and deadlines to be able to seriously, I think, innovate. Or I think it helps innovate. So let's see what Sham says on that. It's a constraints. I definitely agree that constraints drive creativity, 100%. Now, I think you can be overly constrained. So I already have a time constraint. I have a customer constraint. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I have, I have a problem constraint. And, you know, maybe the budget constraint blows, blows it up. What you really want, I mean, that's the job of the talent manager. It's to manage to the budget without exposing the brutal reality of the budget to the talent. You know, how can I get the talent to feel a few less constraints while actually being constrained? You mentioned mistakes over 18 years. I've made many mistakes um, in hiring. When you reflect on yours, what have been some of your biggest hiring mistakes and how did that change how you actually approach hiring? My biggest hiring mistakes were hiring for a factory. You know, actually, as I, as I say now, I think it was like hiring what I thought I would need, hiring what the world told me, you know, the way to solve this problem is to hire this profile. I didn't earn it from first principles. Like the, the, the most successful ones have always been when I took the talent and grew them into the roles that actually reflected their talent. And the worst mistakes were it's where I tried to import a solution to a problem because that's, that's the version, that's my version of the opioid. Wouldn't it be nice if I could just magically import this solution and it will solve all my problems in this area? I, I think I'm like zero for 10. For, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's never worked for me. So what do you do now? First principles. Who do I have? How can I give people more responsibility? How can I stretch them? How do I bet on just raw talent? I, and, I, and when I'm out there meeting people, and I still spend a fair amount of time doing this, I'm not really even thinking about the role. I'm not thinking, I'm thinking about this human. And it's like, would I be excited to fight shoulder to shoulder with this person over the next decade? And can I imagine continuing to invest and grow in them to take on more problems? And if they're talented, I'll figure out the role. They'll figure out the role. We have so many needs. When you've been wrong, what did you get wrong about that decision? So like for me, I've been wrong actually often on my surprise where I've hired very boring people. And my secret to hiring is hire boring people because no one's quite as boring as they seem in a job interview. But they will always be humble if they're boring in the interview. <laughs> and so I find hire the boring. And it, you know, it just might be a reflection of Palantir too. But I think that, that the form of the mistake is thinking that outside knowledge will translate here without a massive retranslation function. And so the sort of personality that's like, look, I've solved this problem before, I know the answer, versus I'm betting on my talent to be able to solve the answer. 
that's the that's the shape of the challenge. Can I ask one final one before we do a quick fire? But you mentioned that Palantir's had quite a few transformations uh, or reincarnations. What do you think was the most challenging reincarnation that Palantir made, and why that one? I honestly think all of them have been challenging, and I, I, the reason they're challenging there's there's the work, which is more obvious. The less obvious part of this sort of reinvention is reinventing yourself. It's the it's the toll on the individual where you're like, look, but I got this thing and it's at this place and it's it's successful and where is my like earned credibility from having done that? And in the reinvention, what you're saying is no, like we're all every single person we're starting from zero. It, yeah, and it might be true that some person who joined t- this company two months ago is going to be more sophisticated at this new problem than you who joined five years ago. And that's, you know, there's a, like a, a commitment to pushing through that. And I, th- I think it's actually only survivable because the whole thing is set up as an artist colony. Is it not harder with more people? Because you have to re-engage, re-communicate that to 2,000, 1,000, whatever that number is. Whereas when there's 100, it's much easier. So actually the reincarnation gets harder over time. That's one aspect that gets harder. Let me give you one aspect that gets easier. The first few times we're doing it, I felt this deep personal responsibility to like handhold everyone through their own reinvention. Um, and that is exhausting. And I felt their pain of, of it. And it's not that I don't feel it now, but I now recognize like that's the medicine. Like I was trying to minimize the pain of the re- reinvention, but actually their greatness is going to come from going through this, this crucible and, and, and being proud of how they reinvented themselves. So now I, I kind of view it as, as I view it proudly rather than with trepidation. Sham, I want to do it for Sham to use the word crucible. I haven't heard that word since um what was that what was that story it was that movie crucible you guys know what i'm talking about there's a certain movie that they use the word crucible fuck if you guys can think of it that would be crazy crucible or is it called the crucible is that the book the crucible by arthur miller is that it like the fact that he finds these words dude it's it's a book right it's a book right yeah the crucible by arthur miller i think i read this shit Salem Witch Trials. Yes, Salem Witch Trials. I read this shit. The fact that he pulled out that word to prove his point is just cool, dude. It's just so cool. All right, this is the rapid fire, uh, quick fire round. Let's see what he has to say. I'm going to move into a quick fire round. So I say a short statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. Okay, so where does value accrue in AI? Startups or incumbents and why? I think it biases towards the incumbents who own applications in the app layer. Why? I think the models are going to be commodity. Because, because the models are not going to really give you enough of the value. It turns out that like you have the model, then getting to a business outcome with that model happens in an application. Uh, and so if you own those pixels, you're going to be able to apply it more quickly. I also think that very few problems are 100% AI. They're like a third AI, a third traditional deterministic code, a third human thought. And the only place you can drive that elegant integration is at the app. Layer. So you think we'll see the commoditization of LLMs? I think so. I'm not saying some won't be better than others, but I'm saying most of them are going to be good. No, I'm just interested because when you look at, you know. All right, I have something to say about this, but let's help them finish. Say, I don't know, cloud over the last 10 years. You know, cloud has relatively been commoditized in terms of like actual product offering. But the biggest players are huge and they're in the infrastructure layer. Yep. And they are the same size as 100 application layer companies. And so I'm just wondering, I get you on the commoditization side, but I still think the value will accrue to those incumbents in the infrastructure layer. I think, I think they'll get a lot, a lot of the compute for sure. And, that's, that's, yeah, and I should say, I think the value is going to accrue in those two directions, infrastructure and app layer, and that the models are going to be squeezed. I get you there. Can I Wait, say- I need to hear him say that again. What exactly does that mean? Let's hear him say that again. In terms of like actual product offering, but the biggest players are huge and they're in the infrastructure layer yep. and they are the same size as a hundred application layer companies. And so I'm just- Basically saying Amazon is as big because they're in the infrastructure of cloud as a hundred application companies on top of AWS. So that's the comparison. AWS, Google, Microsoft as big as all the companies combined that use their platforms for a product offering. Wondering, I get you on the commoditization side, 
but I still think the value will accrue to those incumbents in the infrastructure layer. I think I think they'll get a lot a lot of the compute for sure, and that's that's uh, yeah. And I should say I think the value is going to accrue in those two directions: infrastructure and app layer, and that the models are going to be squeezed. I get interesting. So infrastructure would be something like Palantir. And then the other layer would be something like an AWS. And the models get squeezed, meaning GPT is not, GPT is not infrastructure. GPT is the model. Gemini is not infrastructure. Gemini is the model. Google Cloud and is, is more like the top layer. And then infrastructure is more like Palantir. That's AIP actually connecting to the models to make it make sense. Remember, Palantir has to pay Google, AWS, Microsoft, a cloud compute. They just signed a, a $2 billion 10-year agreement to pay for cloud. So they have to pay the cloud providers um, and they're the application or they're the infrastructure layer, but the applications, which are the models, Sham is saying, aren't going to be that important. Get you there. Can I ask, if you are a model company that doesn't own full vertical supply of compute, are you not screwed? If I was a model company, I would be pushing into the app layer. I'd be trying to figure out how to own more of the value I'm creating with the model rather than just selling an endpoint. And this is usually the opposite advice you're going to get from traditional venture where they're like, build something simple that scales with an API. Every venture investor says, oh, it's a thin layer on top of an LLM. What's the difference between a thin layer and a thick layer in app? That's a good question. Well, do you think? Uh, well, I think a lot of their criticisms are right that essentially if you're just building a chatbot, it's a pretty thin layer. So you, what makes it a thick layer is are, what's the use of deterministic code or algorithmic reasoning in addition to the LLM? What's the integration into workflow? Um, how do humans... You know, are we just, are we still chatting here? Are prompts for developers or for users? Oh, that's a good point, dude. You know, Sean was the, I don't, I don't know if people watched an interview he had a long time ago. Maybe I'll react to it on Daily Pound here because it, it, it's got lost and he was at a defense conference and he was basically saying LLMs are not chatbots. They're a form of compute. So when we think of LLMs, we think of chatbots, which are fine. There's a ton of use cases for chatbots. I think there's going to be a lot of chatbots that exist over the next, you know, five, 10 years, and people are going to find value in them. They're going to pay for them, all that stuff. But he's talking about LLMs as an integrated application within workflows that users are engaging with, not just on the chat side, which AIP is not just a chatbot. AIP is just so much more than that. And so I think his argument is that a lot of these smaller companies, like if you want to build a company that does a million bucks a year, 5 million bucks a year, you can build a chatbot and probably sell it for five, 10, 15 bucks a month. But if you're trying to scale to venture scale, like hundreds of millions in annual recurring revenue, you cannot do that off of a chatbot. Like that's just not going to work. GPT right now is valued at a hundred billion bucks and they've essentially built a chatbot that people like myself are paying 20 bucks a month to. But at the end of the day, you know, Google comes out with something better. I just, I won't use my GPT, right? There's like there's not as uh, there's not as much sophistication inside of a chatbot, even if there's enough use cases in it. So he's talking about a whole new way to think about LLMs, which I think makes a lot of sense in the context of what Pounder is trying to do with AIP, because a chatbot is at the end of the day just a chatbot. Why do LLMs need tools? Because otherwise, you're completely constrained to the parametric knowledge of the model, and I think that's a Sisyphean task. You're, people keep trying to jam more and more knowledge into the model, but what they fail to recognize is that these models are actually very good at speaking regular grammars. JSON, you know, code, it's a regular grammar. How do you use these models in their current state to manage and manipulate application state? Have the core LLM winners been already created or will we see more over the next few years? Some of the folks who have been created are definitely going to be core winners. I think there will be more winners to come. Got you. Um, <laughs> uh, t tell me, who do you think the winner's been so far? Uh, unquestionably, OpenAI has, has done quite well. I think we have we have some time to see where does Google really shake up in, in all of this. Um, and I think Meta has, I mean, it's amazing to see how much they've reinvented themselves around this. Do you worry that development is so far ahead of adoption? Like, I think we all overly get excited. And actually, you know, 50% of European corporates don't know what Slack is. I think the, the, the fear I really have here is how much are we modeling the appropriate use and how, how fixated are we on proof of value instead of proof of concept? We had a self-driving car demo in 2005. It drove 132 miles through the desert. That's really impressive. That's not a toy-like demo. You could argue only in 2023 did we have a proof of a self-driving car that could drive around the city reliably as a commercial commercial offering.
Nobody wants to be in that business. No, no enterprise wants to adopt this thing where the demos are amazing and 20 years from now, they might be able to put this in production. And I think as technologists, in order for us to not be in a bubble, we need to be really focused on proof, not proof of concepts and the speed by which we can affect these enterprises. What have you changed your mind on in the last 12 months? Content and process. I mean, look, content has always mattered, but I always had this view that like, it's got to scale, it's got to scale. I'm, I'm now willing to fight incrementally, you know, almost like trench warfare to get things to scale. You can, have, as long as the process is, the content is gorgeous. You can have dinner with one person, dead or alive. Who would it be and what would you ask them? I'd probably, uh, uh, Begin, former prime minister of Israel, one of kind of the founding fathers. I think it's just, you know, I, I'm, I'm so obsessed with the conditions around founding. You could also pick a, a U.S. founding father. I think we don't study like that the mindset of 1776, the unlikelihood of this, the unlikelihood of founding the modern Israel state, how difficult it was. I, I just want to relish those founder stories. What was your biggest lesson from working with Alex? Probably the most important one is this idea of the artist colony, that, that humans are unique individuals and that you maximize value by staying true to that and never letting yourself aggregate or think about them as, um, as a class. I love that. Um, tell me, final one. What do the next five years hold for you and for Palantir? It's 2028. We sit down again. Where are we then? I think the world is likely to change much more in the next five years than most people are modeling. Uh, the geopolitics are highly unstable. That maybe is a more obvious statement now to say after October 7th. You know, today is uh, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, December 7th, the day that will live in infamy. Um, and I think we're, we're entering a, a very challenging time here. And I think that has consequences for the commercial world as well as, 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 as governments. Uh, but the other aspect of this is as we approach that sort of instability, what is the role for real transformation? Like we have this unique opportunity with AI to actually change things, not just to build businesses, but to fix many of the problems that drive at the fundamental legitimacy of the institutions we have in the world. Why don't these institutions work? Well, I am not someone who thinks you're going to fix them by tearing them down. You're going to fix them by partnering with them and helping them, helping the humans who wake up every day trying to make their institutions work, work better. Listen, Sean, I've loved this. This has been so nice to do one where I'm not talking about pre and post money valuations. Uh, it's been a very different style, but you've been fantastic. So thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you, Harry, for having me. It's been fun. Okay. This was pretty good. Uh, we got a new uh, carp interview as well that came out uh, today. I posted it on my channel. We'll probably react to that. Uh, well, I'll probably react to clips of that instead of reacting to the whole thing because I posted it, but we'll check that out as well. Uh, this was a really good interview. I think a couple of key takeaways from my perspective. Number one, um, I think Sham and team are pretty clear on defining where the value is going to go in this post LLM world. And I think they've thought about it very clearly. You know, the fact that in April, Carp came out with this whole product AIP and, you know, they, like they pretty much designed it, I would imagine, in three, four months. If in December, ChatGPT really uh, was rolled out to the public, March, it went mainstream. By April, these guys came out with AIP. It means they were thinking about this for a very long time. Remember, large language models is not, again, just a chatbot. It's a whole new form of computational understanding of data. And what is Palantir? A company that's rooted in data and data analytics and big data and how to deal with data and how to make data more optimized. So if they weren't on the AI train, if they weren't doing AIP, if they weren't building this type of infrastructure, there would be no, you know, there would, there would be no real bull case for Palantir given how deeply rooted they are in data analytics. So the fact that they are that deep inside of it means they've been thinking about it for a very long time. They've been trying to conceptualize where the world is going to go. And as, you know, as Carp said many, many, many times, Palantir is a company. Um, that is building products for the world five years before they know that they need it. And so this, it seems like, you know, five years ago, if they tried to come up with something like AIP, it just wouldn't make sense because people had no conception of what a large language model is. But it, but they've been working on this stuff, it seems like, for five years. And that's why they were easily able to roll it out in April. And then they had two conferences in one year. I mean, think about it. ChatGPT went mainstream, right? Everyone... And still, you know, when I say everyone hyperbolically, your parents probably don't know what LLMs are, right? Or ChatGPT. I mean, a lot of people still don't know what ChatGPT is. I'm surprised when I ask some people and they're just like, what is that? Uh, so the world still has to know, but it's not synonymous with Googling yet. But eventually it will be. 
And it seems like within that first year of it happening, Palantir was able to host two conferences, get all their customers on it, try to get some hopefully higher net dollar retention going into Q4 by getting existing clients to try out AIP and then getting those new clients integrated. We saw the Option Care Health contract and we saw a variety of other contracts over the past couple of months that they've been able to sign. It seems like they decided a couple of months ago where the value was going to go. And as Sham said, it was either going to go to the cloud layer or to the infrastructure layer and the model layer was going to get commoditized. I think he's right about that. I think he's very, very right about that. GPT, Gemini, Anthropic, Poe.com, Snapchat's AI, all of these are just the same models that might be trained a little differently on different parameters. Llama by, by Meta, the open source version. It's not where the money is. Because if it's open sourced and it's free and all the information is there, there's no money. That's why this is such an existential threat to Google because Google is... Uh, at the end of the day, it's a search engine. It's not that special, but they're the best version of compiling all of the world's information for free and monetizing on top of that via ads. Um, these models take away the whole conception of search, right? Because you can just type something right in and you get a direct response. And if they're going to give you the same response, how do I bake a chocolate chip cookie? Whether you ask Microsoft's version or Amazon's version or Google's version, you're going to get roughly the same good result. You're not going to have to go to like 17 different blocks to find the answers which is why the models are ultimately going to become commodities, which means if the models are going to become commodities, the utilization of those models inside of either the enterprise or inside of consumers' life lives is going to be the core thesis for how this ultimately plays out. And uh, if, if, if those models don't become operationalized in a meaningful way, then they're not going to be, um, they're just not going to be accruing meaningful value. So Sham in this interview seems to be saying, hey, we've thought about this deeply. We don't think the models are going to be the major winners. Some of them will be, but we don't think they're going to get all the money. We think the cloud players are going to get a shit ton of money. Google, Amazon, Microsoft, they're going to get a ton of money because to run these models, you need compute. That's why OpenAI working with Microsoft. If OpenAI didn't have Microsoft Azure, they, they wouldn't be able to do all the computational uh, legwork that it takes to put out these results. Which means... It only comes down to the companies that are implementing the models within an enterprise or within a consumer, you know, mobile device. We saw Rabbit uh, sell out 60,000 different devices at 200 bucks a pop because they're creating the infrastructure for that AI to make sense. Uh, but that's, again, more consumer, less enterprise. Or it's going to be the cloud providers. And if that's the case, Palantir are obviously not a cloud provider. They're, they're paying money to Google, Microsoft, Amazon. So they want to be on the infrastructure layer. Can the infrastructure layer get to three to $500 billion in market cap over the next 10 years? I think so, because I think if every enterprise in the world needs LLMs as a form of computational infrastructure, meaning you can't have an organization that is not powered via LLMs. You can't be Verizon. You can't be AT&T. You can't be Carnival Cruise. You can't be these major companies and not have every single department of your organization fueled, not by chatbots, but by LLMs that are making uh, domain subject experts within finance, account, accounting, marketing, programming, et cetera, more effective and productive because top line revenue is not going to increase. Operating income is not going to increase. Operating margin is definitely not going to increase. And you're not going to reduce costs either. You really need to be able to have all four of those things come through in order for shareholders to see uh, outside gains or at least see more growth and progress to be able to get gains. So it's going to be super, super exciting to see, you know, how that plays out. Uh, yeah, I just saw Vlad's tweet. I just uh, quote tweeted it. Uh, Vlad says, for anyone who cares about Robinhood, there's been a surge in demand for our 3% IRA and old, and old 401k rollover match. We're working hard with our partners to expand our com capacity to meet that demand. Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, yeah, there's, if you're, if you're invested in Robinhood, there's a, <laughs> there's a ton of uh, momentum going on there on Robinhood. So that's pretty exciting. But in general, yeah, I, I think Palantir has, has defined the right route to be able to go in the right direction. Quarantine Quartet says holding Palantir since 2021 has given me a vertigo. Dude, I talked to some investors today that have been holding Palantir. I mean, these guys have millions of shares. I was, I was on the phone with a couple of these people today. And um, let's just say there's big money, the big retail money in Palantir. Like one of the guys I was talking to today, he was like, there's no way the company's not three, 500 billion in the next couple of years. Not sorry, ne not next couple of years, in the next like five to 10 years. Do not buy because he said that that's his opinion his thoughts but he's been in palantir for a while and he has millions and millions of shares and uh, there's big people with big beliefs around this company and they see something fundamentally different and i think what they see that's different is the computational architecture that these guys apply when thinking about big data problems and because they think uh, in such a unique way so different in my opinion than snowflake and and you know some of these other guys 
That's why it's exciting to invest in Palantir. And that's why the investor community of Palantir is so exciting. Because you got some people that got millions of shares. Then you got a couple other people that have thousands of shares, but they're still some of the smartest people in the world. And you and you then you got other people that are just getting into the company, but they're interested in data and, and, and science and all this stuff. And it's just super, super excited. Uh, super, super exciting to see all these people come together and get excited about this. One other point I want to mention is Snowflake. Uh, Snowflake right now, after hours, is up heavily. Snowflake, look at that, uh, $208. It's at basically a $70 billion market cap. My question is, is Palantir allowed to be at 35 to $37 billion when Snowflake is double? And Snowflake's A, not profitable. They're spending a shit ton of money on sales and marketing from their revenue. They're increasing stock-based compensation like a mother effer. And the market's giving it this ridiculous of a premium. I don't know, dude. I don't know if Snowflake deserves 70 billion. I don't say, I don't think Palantir deserves 70 billion yet. I just don't know if Snowflake deserves 70 billion. But Snowflake is Wall Street's, you know, golden child, given that uh, Warren Buffett originally, I don't think he has the shares anymore, but he made like 800 million off the IPO. So, I mean, you know, people have always loved Snowflake. I just think if Palantir can show the growth, then it's going to be very, very exciting because they're not going to be able to justify the divergence between Palantir and Snowflake in terms of market cap. There's just no way. Samuel Shaw says, I've acuted, I've started accumulating since $28 and now my average is $8. Bought the trough, not the dip. Yeah, I, 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 the guy I was talking to today, he's been buying since that $30, $40 range and just DCAing down. You know, a lot of people just believe in the company. Now, a lot of people were early. I mean, that's because in 2021, no one knew the whole company would go to shit, right? The whole market would go to shit. So we were all early. Like, yeah, the 2021, there was a little bit of a bubble. But we were definitely not wrong, in my opinion. And as long as Palantir can execute on the growth, um, you know, I, I think we're going to be very right instead of wrong, to be honest. Um, what about when everyone starts charging for their data? Will it be affordable? Remember, Palantir is offering the picks and shovels for companies to be able to understand and operationalize their data. So companies are never going to charge for their data. Companies need to do something with their data. And that's where you buy Palantir software. When it comes to start charging for their data, if you're talking about LLMs, like uh, for example, the New York Times, if they start saying, hey, uh, you know, Microsoft GPT, you got to pay us 20 million a year if you want to train yourself on our articles. Yeah, that's another way where the models get commoditized because then it's a question of, okay, you know, if the New York Times is only going to give you their content, if you pay them for it, then which model, Google, Meta, et cetera, is going to pay the most for it? And do they even want that content in the first place? And if they do, are you willing to pay a subscription to ChatGPT because they're trained on the New York Times versus Google if they're not trained on the New York Times? Like, do you value the New York Times content that much in the training of the model? I don't know. These stories are going to have to play out. But I don't want to be invested in that. I want to be invested in the infrastructure part of the LLM revolution, the AI revolution, where companies need to manage their data, need to make sense of their data. And you need a ton of infrastructure for that to actually operationalize throughout the entire company. Otherwise, like, you're just investing in you know, a, a bot that's trained off of the New York times. And that's not that exciting. That's just not that exciting. Um, so I, I, I think, I think that's where Pouch is going to play a role over the next decade. Uh, Crosso says, I think hood misses on gap this quarter due to customer acquisition costs plus the rest of the lawsuit. Yeah. I think hood's not going to make profitability. If they do, the stock's going to, I think do very well. If they don't, uh, I think the sheer growth in assets under custody that, that, uh, that hood brings onto the platform is going to be huge. And I don't, I don't think investors are going to care about gap profits, at least this quarter. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. In general, I kind of think there's a way they're going to squeeze gap profits. I could be wrong, but I think they're going to squeeze it out. If they don't, though, I don't think anyone's going to care. I mean, dude, if they're having this much demand for their, for, for their uh, match, that just means people want to use the platform. And the good thing about it is, is that they're, they're forcing you to keep the money on for five years. So you can't even take the money out. And in those five years, the goal is to fall in love with Robinhood. And if the product keeps getting better, you know, people probably will. Uh, Sal says, I think with B2C products and betting models, the amount of new data collection is going to be so large that there may not be a lot of value for high price legacy data eventually. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good argument. That's a really, really, really good argument. Um, a lot of the B2C products that are embedding models and having so much data, a lot of the legacy content probably is going to be less valuable than we think. Right, like the New York Times doesn't matter. That I mean, this is why Elon bought Twitter at the end of the day. He wanted the data, right? Um, and and if you wanted the data, then and you're getting real time updates at the tune of a hundred million tweets a day, you kind of don't need the New York Times' articles because you have so much of that user generated content already there. That's going to be more exciting. Lunar says Palantir uses model binding. It trains the models not only on data, but on decisions made. Yeah, that's such a good point. The other reason why AIP is so important, and people have missed this, but um, I, 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 I showed a tweet once from the European Cricket Network founder. This is a guy who's in the foundry for Builder Suite. 
and he used AIP and he tweeted once publicly that he asked it a question and it went through four different variations of answers. And on the fifth variation, that was the answer he was looking for. That was KLLMs. And that is a highly sophisticated technological process where you ask a question and it goes through Anthropic or Claude or, 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 or GPT or Gemini or Llama. And it synthesizes all of those answers to come up with the best version of what the answer could be. And that's where the real value is for the end user that's using it, not just putting it into ChatGPT and seeing what answer they get from it. So I think there's a ton of value there from training the model not on the data, but once that model gives a decision and it was like, all right, number five was the best answer, the model now knows, okay, so next time you ask me a question that is similar to this or in the same vein as this, I'm gonna give you an answer that is similar um, you know, based on this decision as well, which is gonna be super, super, super important. So. Uh, it's going to be really exciting, dude. It's going to be really, really exciting going into the next decade of how this ends up working out. And I think Pounter is trying to do it the right way, especially in the context of where AIP is growing. And that's why I think Carp is so cocky about it because he knows it's a game you know you can win. You don't have to compete with the models. If you're competing with Gemini or G GPT, you're not going to win. You don't have to compete with the cloud providers because you're not going to win, right? That, that game has already been decided. But on the infrastructure layer, Pounter is a really big shot to win. And it takes a smart investor dare i say to understand that infrastructure layer and how big that opportunity is and it obviously the company is to execute but i think we are right that that opportunity is fucking massive if the company just executes then hopefully it'll be there and then finally i want to say same thing for defense why did chat gpt just change their terms of service to allow the military to use their product they didn't for the past year is because they realize there's a shit ton of money in defense <laughs> there's not that much money in the consumer, right? Like my 20 bucks a month is not going to build you a multi-billion dollar business. You need big, big, big contracts. And that is in the military. That's in NATO. That's in all those other places. So I think that's what ChatGPT realized. And, you know, that's why those models have shifted as well to allow them and allow the government. No one else even talks about the AI this, let alone having boot camps about selling it 100%. No one's talking about AI like this and no one's actually having boot camps to have product-led growth. All right. Exciting stuff. Great interview. We'll be back for deep dives tomorrow. I'll have a new topic we're talking about, but it was a fun interview. Thank you all for watching it with me. And yeah, we'll keep going from there. I'll see you guys tomorrow on the market open, 8.45 AM for those that want to join and deep dives tomorrow at 8 PM discussing and deep diving on a new topic when it comes to Pound Trail. We got a lot of new interviews to dissect. So probably be going through more of that stuff and keep it going from there. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. I will see you guys tomorrow. We'll have finance junkies in about seven minutes on that channel. Have a good night. Bye-bye.